Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Benzo Warrior Community Zoom meeting. Today, we have a special guest, and I might mess this up, Lieutenant Commander Mark Keller, who's also known as Slider. Mark, thank you for joining us today. Lieutenant Commander Mark Keller, U.S. Navy retired, is an engineer, entrepreneur, former F-14 Tomcat radar, radar intercept officer, FA-18 FA weapon system officer, father of two sons, and a seasoned combat veteran who retired from the U.S. Navy suffering from PTSD and depression. He had a difficult experience with the VA and, like so many others, was medicated into oblivion on Ativan and then further harmed by an uninformed cold turkey cessation. It turns out that the tolerance dependence induced by years on Ativan set him up for the biggest fight of his life. Having survived all of this, he is now simply grateful to be alive. Like a rapidly increasing number of other veterans, Slider found healing transformation through Ibogaine and 5-MEO-DMT assisted therapy, still illegal in the US, but that is changing and has now dedicated his life to helping others and find paths to wellness and to combating the tragedy of veteran suicide. He is also one of the subjects of the documentary film, No Fallen Heroes, which tells the stories of combat aircrew who have found new life through psychedelic assisted therapy. Mark's talk today is titled, A Warrior's Toughest Fight. Thank you, Mark, for joining us and speaking with us. We are glad you're here and we are glad everyone here is here at this event. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, great in introduction there, Lisa. Yes, uh, today is a good day. Uh, and I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad I'm here. So we're all doing that. Uh, we're all doing better than some other folks. So uh, let's be grateful for that. Um, I have several parts to uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you know, each of us has some reason that we ended up on a benzodiazepine, uh, and those stories, you know, vary greatly. Some some people were headed that way without a lot of big things happening in their lives. Um, some people have really big things that happen in their lives, and that's certainly part of my story. And that'll be the first part I'll talk about. Um, you know, once uh, you get on the benzodiazepines, well, then you know, there's different experiences. I happen to be someone who's exquisitely sensitive. So in that smaller cohort uh, of people and, you know, the prescribing physician just didn't understand, uh, you know, the risks associated with these medicines and, you know, had no way to detect uh, what I was going through. And I was on Ativan for about four and a half years while I went downhill pretty badly and and predictably uh, given the underlying conditions that I was dealing with. Uh, you know, I cold turkey and I went through a very, very challenging thing there. And as the title of the talk suggests, that's the toughest thing I've ever been through, still going through it. Um, you know, a couple of years of tapering and then uh, trying to clean up the mess that was left behind is, is the rest of the story. So, um, I very much look forward uh, to your questions. So as I speak, please do, uh, you know, if you take notes, I know a lot of us have a little trouble remembering things from time to time. Write, write down anything you want to hear about. I very uh, much hope that uh, we'll have a, a good, lively discussion afterwards and uh, that maybe that helps some of you all out. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm from upstate New York, uh, Syracuse area. I've got... Uh, my father recently passed away, but my you know parents were, were married throughout all of that. I've got a younger brother, had a pretty normal childhood. Um, he lived in a fairly rural area, spent my days running around the woods and skiing and snowmobiling and riding motorcycles and just all the great stuff that a boy wants to do. Uh, you know, my family wasn't perfect, just like, just like everyone's. And uh, many, many, many years later, I had to excavate some things that it maybe were deep in my subconscious uh, from my childhood. And like, like everyone has, sometimes those things come up later in life. But I would say pretty much my, my uh, you know, I grew up normal and healthy and, and everything was great. Um, went off, uh, went off to school, 
I ended up uh, at the University of Florida. I got a degree in electrical engineering and was pursuing a, a PhD in electrical engineering, as a matter of fact. Uh, when one day I just, uh, something happened. I kind of had these two lives. I was working my way through uh, through school, doing my research, uh, we were doing some uh, advanced radar research, neural network processing, all, all kinds of edgy stuff that was very satisfying to me. Uh, but I was paying my way through school. And, you know, so I worked in the lab during the week. And on the weekends, I was busy jumping out of airplanes doing free fall photography. So as you can imagine, there was a you know, pretty stark contrast between these two aspects of my life. And, uh, you know, as a uh, I started to realize that I needed a little bit of adventure in my life. And though the intellectual work in the lab was very satisfying, I, I said, you know what, how can I take this, this interest in research and learning and, and investigating things and mix that with something that's really cool and adventurous. And I, I literally shoved my chair back in the lab one day and said, uh, you know, I revisited something that I'd kind of given up on from my childhood. I said, I want to be an astronaut. So, you know, a young man uh, may, may not be aware of his limitations, <laughs> but I said, okay, how do I become an astronaut? So I started looking at it and uh, turns out the best way to do that is go to uh, Navy test pilot school. So to do that, you got to get into the Navy first and then you got to go fly jets and do all that stuff. And of course I'd seen uh, the movie Top Gun. So I had to fly F-14s and, uh, I literally got the phone book out, uh, looked up U.S. Navy. I called the recruiter and said, hey, I want to fly F-14. Sign me up. And, you know, they laughed. Uh, but I made it happen. So, you know, next thing you know, I was uh, out of school. I, w I walked away from uh, a pretty good deal there, but uh, off to my life of adventure. And uh, you know, my intent was always go to, to go to test pilot school and uh, try to use that as a, a way to get into NASA. So. Pretty exciting life, uh, as you can imagine, all the stuff you have to go through in flight training and, and the various, uh, you know, hurdles you have to get over and filters. And that, there's a lot of them. It takes some years, but uh, it's stressful. It's a lot of stress. And it's just you're constantly uh, being evaluated, constantly under a microscope, constantly expected to perform at a very high level. And, you know, I liked that. Uh, you know, again, we'll go back to jumping out of airplanes. I was a thrill seeker, still am. Very high threshold of adrenaline. I like the pressure. I like the action. Uh, and I thrived on that. And, you know, I did very well. And I ended up in uh, F-14s like I had planned. Fast forward uh, some years here. Now it's uh, in early 1990 now. And I got into my first fleet fighter squadron uh, via 14 top hatters. Uh, we deployed aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt early in the spring of uh, 1999, just as the Kosovo conflict kicked off. Um, that was the real deal. Uh, they had, you know, with what we consider fourth generation Soviet integrated air defenses, uh, which meant they had, you know, advanced radar systems, um, some advanced missile systems that were certainly capable of reaching out and, uh, and shooting down an F-14 and pretty much any other aircraft we had at that time. If you recall, an F-117 uh, stealth fighter went down, a couple of their planes were shot down in Kosovo. And, uh, you know, there I was, young Lieutenant Keller, uh, right up in it. So we were, uh, you know, going out, dropping a lot of laser guided bombs, doing armed reconnaissance, uh, hauling butt, pulling G's, just just constant, constant action because, you know, we never knew what we were going to get shot at. So it was pretty athletic. Uh, it was very stressful. Um, you, know, you have a tough technical job to do under some, you know, physically difficult conditions there. But, you know, this is what happens when you're in combat is you just adapt to that. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more as I get into my story here about those adaptations, which are very germane to our experiences with benzodiazepines. So anyway, in that conflict, uh, I learned an awful lot about laser guided bombs as all of us did um, on that aircraft carrier. Uh, it was the weapon of choice and uh, we had just got a lot of experience with it. Um, you know, as a research engineer, 
uh, maybe my curiosity went a little deeper on some of that stuff. And I, I, I believe I probably became at least at the time when, you know, one of the world's experts, uh, on this particular weapon called the pave way to laser guided bomb. So fast forward, uh, my next deployment, uh, was in the spring of 2001. In 2001, uh, same squadron via 14 carrier air wing eight, we, uh, were aboard the USS enterprise, uh, and we spent the vast majority of that deployment in the Persian Gulf, uh, flying missions in support of, uh, the Southern, uh, Southern watch. So enforcing the Southern no fly zone imposed by the United Nations at that time, uh, you know, Saddam was pretty active at that time and, uh, they were always testing our resolve, flying into the no fly zone or moving surface air missiles or, or any aircraft artillery down into that Southern part of Iraq. And it was our job to kind of go down, fly around and, uh, you know, kind of keep track of what's going on and, and react when they did things like shooting at us, which happened quite a few times. So I got to see some of that and I got to drop some more Paveway 2 laser guided bombs uh, on some um, anti aircraft sites. Uh, we got shot at with some anti aircraft artillery. I, I have seen, just like in the movies, little puffs appearing around the airplane and all that stuff as those things detonate at your altitude. All right you know, you're real busy uh, while you're running these missions. And so you don't really have time to be scared while that's happening. Uh, you're just working hard and doing your job, but uh, you know, neurochemically you're in a very elevated state, you know, of necessity uh, and you become accustomed to that. So, you know, now, now here, this is my second deployment. It's been about a year of all this kind of stuff. So, we had a great opportunity uh, in September as we were nearing our six month point in our deployment. Uh, we were going to head south through the Suez Canal, which we did on uh, September 9th, 2001, on our way to a port visit in South Africa, uh, which is pretty unusual. They hadn't allowed a nuclear aircraft carrier in there for about 20 years. Uh, you know, normally we'd go back up through the, uh, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and out through the Mediterranean on our way home. We were going to go to South Africa, so we were pretty excited about that. And we had a safari uh, set up, and we were going to go cave dive uh, with the great white sharks and all this fun stuff that, that guys like us like to do. So we were pretty psyched about that. And, um, you know, everyone was tired from a long deployment. And, you know, most of the guys were probably in the rack sleeping. Uh, on uh on september 11th uh we were steaming south probably i'm guessing off the uh, southern coast of, of somalia in the northern indian ocean and i just happened to uh be on the schedule that day to fly a post maintenance tech flight so we had some aircraft that had been down in the hangar deck and, and we're getting some work done on them we had to get them ready to fly off when we got back off the coast of Virginia here. So I was sitting there in my flight gear, just waiting for this jet to come up and it was going to go do a pretty routine flight. It was me and the duty officer in the usual, in the, in what is usually a very busy place, the ready room. And we had the TV on. And so just like a lot of you, I watched uh, the twin towers go down on television. And uh, the difference for me was, uh, you know, I was on a U.S. aircraft carrier, uh, just west of Pakistan. He, East of Somalia there. So within about three minutes, I remember that because I just happened to look at my watch, but it took about three minutes for us to turn that aircraft carrier around. We knew we weren't leaving the Middle East with that. Um, of course, our deployment was extended for, uh, I think, about five weeks or so. Uh, but we you know, very quickly put ourselves off the coast of Pakistan, ready to go into Afghanistan to fly strike missions. Um, we had to wait for a couple of weeks, you know, there's some diplomatic stuff that had to happen. We needed to, you know, get over a flight of Pakistan to get into Afghanistan and we needed to get some, uh, airborne tankers and stuff like that to, to help us get up, you know, from the ship all the way up to Kabul. It's about 800 miles or so. So, you know, from here in Virginia beach, think of, uh, you know, if I got to go drop some bombs in in Kabul, it's the same thing as flying to maybe Kansas and back every day. So that's, uh. That's what our lives look like. But we had a couple weeks of uh, intel briefs and mission planning. Uh, you know, obviously we had to take out 
they're fairly modest air defenses. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot about uh, what the Taliban was up to, what Al Qaeda was up to. Uh, we learned a lot about what would happen to us if we got shot down, which was not pretty. Um, and it was, uh, you know, that was a stressful time. I mean, uh, this is the second time in my career that we got to, I say got to, but we kicked off a war. So, you know, if you're a professional warrior, that's, you know, this is it. It's game day. Uh, so at the time, we you know, certainly felt very justified in doing that and honored to have the opportunity to, to serve in that way. Um, we flew the first strikes uh, into Afghanistan. Um, there was much less resistance than there was in, in Kosovo. Uh, we did get shot at a little bit and we took out all their surface to missile sites and the uh, surface air missile sites in the first couple of days. But, uh, you know, it was stressful. It was very stressful. So came home from that. Uh, we had another aircraft carrier coming to us out of Norfolk. They were in the Med at the time. And once they got down on station, we got to go home. Uh, unfortunately, we skipped our safaris and shark dives. We went right back through the Mediterranean and, and got home. So we were the first carrier back from the war in Afghanistan, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, we got a hero's welcome. And uh, you know, it was the first time I started hearing uh, you know, at the gas pump and someone said, thank you for your service. Uh, first time I'd heard of that. It was, it was pretty cool. Um, felt really good about that. And, you know, that continues to this day. So that's a good thing. Uh, fast forward uh, some more. Let's see. I'm now, uh, what did I do after that? I was an instructor uh, in the F-14 back here in Virginia Beach for some years. Uh, when the 2003 war kicked off in Afghanistan, uh, like all the other guys who were instructors at that point, especially those of us who had just come back from back-to-back -back combat deployments, we wanted to go. But uh, we couldn't go. We had to had to keep training guys. It's just part of the system. So um, I missed most of that one. But uh, fast forward to 2005, uh, I'm now a young lieutenant commander, and I am back at sea in, in an operational capacity. Uh, this time I was the strike operations officer for carrier air wing eight, same air wing, uh, different set of orders. But at, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm not a squadron guy. I'm working for the air wing commander. So all the squadrons on an aircraft carrier, they all work for the air wing commander and I was on the air wing staff. So my job at that time was, uh, there a lot of aspects to it, but one of it was to advise the uh, uh, air wing commander on what tactics and weapons employment methods and what weapons loads we should use and, and all kinds of stuff like that uh, that were appropriate for what we expected to see when we got into action. So um, on our way over there, uh, remember the invasion happened uh, in 2003. Uh, we're now at 2005. So we've you know, we've established air superiority at this point. We can pretty much fly around, at least at high altitude, uh, without worrying too much about being shot down or anything like that. But we had some other problems. Uh, you know, at this point, we're, we're trying to flush out Al Qaeda networks, figure out where their safe houses are. You know, we're trying very much trying to build our intelligence pictures so that we can, you know, crush their network and, and stop the insurgency that's going on. As part of that, um, we were dropping a lot of bombs in populated areas, which is a very, very difficult business, even with you know advanced laser guided weapons. We did not have, uh, you know, now we have GPS enhanced laser guided weapons, but at that time we did not. So basically, what we would do is we would drop a bomb and and let it fall dumb. Uh, as we say, and at some point we would turn a laser on to designate the target and that bomb would see that laser spot on the ground and we'd try to fly to that spot and, you know, hopefully hit exactly where you want it to. But there, there's some problems around that. They don't always work the way they're supposed to. And, you know, I was pretty aware of this uh, as we were headed over there. And, you know, one of my big concerns was, uh, you know, what are we, are we delivering these things in a way that, best minimizes the potential for collateral damage. And 
you know, I had some arguments around that based on my experience in, uh, you know, two previous combat deployments. Um, unfortunately, uh, what I understood to be the best way was in conflict with uh, some of the doctrine at the time. Um, you know, I'm sure you all have seen the Top Gun movies. They're really cool, great movies. I love them too. Um, they don't really depict what Top Gun does though. I mean, Top Gun is a place where they develop tactics and they train instructors to go back out to the fleet and, and uh, standardize tactics and procedures and make sure that we're all doing business the same way and we're held to a high standard of excellence. It's a good thing. I mean, Top Gun's a very, very good thing. It's one of the reasons we're so good at what we do, but you know, Top Gun is made of humans uh, and humans are fallible and, and sometimes our systems are fallible too. Sometimes it takes some time for things to get back to the schoolhouse and be processed and put into doctrine and uh you know i kind of got caught in that loop a little bit so you know i am not a top gun graduate but i did have some pretty good experience uh with these weapons and and it was you know i knew at the time that top guns recommended tactics were not applicable uh in that particular theater um Interestingly, my commanding officer and his deputy were both former Top Gun instructors who hadn't been in combat before. I'm sorry, Top Gun commanding officers, neither of which had been in combat before. So uh, these are wonderful human beings. I love these guys. They're professionals, uh, very smart guys, capable fighter pilots. In no way would I ever say anything uh, you know, bad about their character or, or really even their decision making. It, it was just the structure we operated in. But, uh, you know, I tried to convince them that we should ignore Top Gun's recommendations and do business a different way. Uh, and, you know, I just failed to do that. I don't think they could get there. You, you can't be a top commanding officer of Top Gun and then the first time you go out and actually go to war, say Top Gun's wrong. I mean, that's the dissonance there is, is too much. So. Uh, you know, after harping on my commanding officer for a while about this, um, you know, Mike Nicosageway, his deputy stopped me and said, hey, Slaughter, you got to knock it off, man. You know, I appreciate your passion, but uh, you're pissing the boss off and, you know, you just need to do what, do what you're told. And, you know, what, what could I say other than aye, aye, sir? And, uh, you know, off I went and did my job. Wow. Fast forward a couple months. I'm now mission commander. Uh uh, over a town uh, in northern Iraq called Baji, about 60 miles northwest of Baghdad, kind of between Mosul and Baghdad. Uh, turns out the night before, uh, we had a forward operating base there, a real small one. Uh, some guys were out on patrol, and on their way back through this town of Baji, had been blown up uh, by an improvised explosive device, or IED, uh, and they lost some guys. Um, so it turns out the next night, when we just happened to be responsible for that grid square that that Baji's in we're just hanging out overhead like we did night after night just you know waiting for someone who needs some help from us and we get the call on the radio about a um an iraqi civilian had had seen some things uh, on that same road where that incident had been the night before and had reported it to an iraqi police station uh and after a whole lot of communication and and translation and all this stuff uh, you know the end result was that we had to drop a bomb on some guys who were rigging up another ied on that same road um so a very righteous mission and, and it was proved later that that is in fact what they were doing but uh, i had a little problem here because it was uh you know we had to drop a bomb on these guys in a house in the middle of the town um and you know here i am i'm the mission commander now I am not a pilot. I am the backseat guy. I'm Goose or Bob, if you saw the second Top Gun movie. Wow. <laughs> Let's think more Goose. But, uh, you know, the guy in my front seat had been one of my students as an F-14 instructor. He'd never dropped a bomb in combat. He was a much younger guy, junior to me. Um, and, you know, I was on the air wing staff. I wasn't in his squad, and I was kind of a guest on their flight schedule. However, I'm the mission commander. so. You know, we had a discussion in the cockpit about how we should drop this bomb. And, you know, I can't fault him, uh, you know, as a fairly junior lieutenant for 
you know, saying, no, we're going to do what the boss said we should do. And I said, no, we're going to do what's right. And, you know, so we had a moral dilemma going on in the cockpit and we really just needed to put that bomb on the ground. So, you know, when we went uh, out for our bombing run, I really hadn't decided, am I going to defy orders and do what I think is safest or am I going to, you know, cover my ass and do it the way I was ordered to do. So when the bomb came off, uh, we did what we were ordered to do. And, you know, tragically, that bomb fell short, hit the house next door uh, and killed a, a dozen innocent people. So, uh, you know, that was 2005. That was a long time ago. But I will tell you that, you know, that's that type of story is not uncommon, you know, for our combat veterans. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you're still out in deployment. You still got to keep flying. You still got to do your job. And you just take stuff like that and you put it in a box. Um, and, you know, after multiple combat deployments, now, unlike a lot of other guys, um, I had a lot of boxes of elephants. I, I like to call it my warehouse full of elephant boxes. So, you know, it's really easy to see uh, when you're talking about, about something as colorful as, as combat, but you know, what I've learned since is, you know, we all do that to some degree. Uh, sometimes we call them, we call them traumas. Right? Or sometimes they're little traumas and they accumulate and they add up to a big elephant. Sometimes it's a big trauma and it's, it's elephant of its own. But, you know, we all collect these elephants and, you know, sometimes that's the reason we end up on benzodiazepines. Uh, I'm sure everyone here has a story about why you ended up on that first dose and, you know, and our stories afterwards are tend to be kind of similar. And I'll, I'll tell you about mine, but, you know, fast forward some years, um, you know, and I retired from the uh, military in uh, February of 2013. Now, let me go back and talk about physical and neurochemical adaptations. You know, humans are very robust creatures. We, ended up where we are in the food chain because of our ability to adapt and think and react. And, uh, you know, the stress of combat is, um, you know, one of those things you adapt to. So when, when guys deploy over and over and over again, particularly guys who are what I call trigger pullers, guys who go into bad guy land and get shot at and have to kill people and all that stuff. Uh, you know, again, you're forced to operate in a very, a very high level of neuro excitation, which you know is probably familiar to most folks as fight or flight. Uh, and I'm not saying you're in the cockpit being panicked. What I'm saying is, you know, your glutamate's up, uh, your cortisol's up, your, you know, you're thinking faster, your vision's enhanced, your hearing's enhanced, maybe breathe a little harder, your heart's pumping. I mean, that's that's what combat is. And when you do it over and over and over again, you know, of necessity, your body reacts that way. Because if it doesn't, you, you know, possibly fail at your mission, uh, possibly end up dead or, or maybe other people are killed. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot at stake here. So you just become comfortable with that. And that becomes you, your thresholds are all adjusted up. So neurochemically, you're in a very high state of alert. And after many, many years of that, uh, adaptations become semi-permanent. Um, uh, you know, a lot of guys call it uh, operator syndrome now, and that's not necessarily PTSD in the in the traditional sense. Uh, you know, certainly if you're in a foxhole and your best friend's head gets blown off, uh, you know, the, <laughs> sorry about how graphic that is, but I mean, obviously that's a very traumatizing event, and that's kind of what people think of, I think, when they talk about PTSD, but. There's also this thing that we call operator syndrome. And I, I think the SEAL community, special forces guys kind of kind of figured this out. It's just that high level of excitation becomes your new normal. And then when you become out, you come out of the structure of the military, the purpose, uh, you know, of each of your days, and all of a sudden all that's not around you. You're not surrounded by other guys operating the same way. You know, we end up back in the civilian world here. And everything's moving in slow motion. Uh, you know, you're still going fast and everything around here, it's painfully slow. Um, you know, you're on high alert all the time. You just driving down the road, every vehicle's a threat. Um, 
it bothers you that people can't focus on purpose or mission and you see a lot of stupidity around you and yeah that sounds arrogant but coming out of that environment i, I think it's it's kind of understandable so you know i came out of that uh with that problem you know i had some depression from the, the innocence i'd killed and I really hadn't dealt with that uh and i was in that high level of neuro excitation um you know, somewhere in there, uh, you know, my wife left me and, and I had prostate cancer too. So there, there was a lot, a lot of stuff went on. By the way, both those things are very common uh, amongst career military guys. Uh, prostate cancer is a, a huge thing, particularly in tactical aviators. We're not quite sure why. Maybe it's because of flying next to the cosmos with nothing but a piece of plexiglass over your head. Maybe it's because of the big radar sitting down between your legs you know, breathing manufactured gases, jet fuel in the water on a ship. I mean, I don't know. We're trying to figure that out. But prostate cancer is a really huge thing. And, you know, one thing, uh, this is a big men's issue, but when you go through prostate cancer without any counseling and emotional support around that, that's actually a pretty traumatizing thing too. And, you know, unfortunately mine happened right after my wife and I split. So that, you know, that was exacerbating. Um. And then I had the uh, too young, too hot, too crazy girlfriend, uh, which made things even worse. So the adrenaline junkie, no more combat, no more flying jets off of aircraft carriers. Uh, I, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe I was just me a, a way of finding uh, uh, some more excitement. But um, you know, I started a business uh, a little before I got out, actually, and it was it was moving along nicely as as I retired from the. Uh, from the Navy. So I was very busy working on that, and, you know, I had this, this relationship that, that was not healthy. And, uh, you know, eventually all these factors that were, you know, do the math on the timeline. I mean, it took 20 years for all this stuff to accumulate, but you know, a guy who was perfectly healthy, otherwise, um, got pushed to the point where I had a single panic attack, just one. And it, you know, shame on me for, for thinking prior to that, that, you know, a panic attack was a, a, an excuse of the weak minded to not keep their shit together, but uh, that's not it at all. I'm sure a lot of people in this group are well aware of how awful those things can be. Um, and I learned, uh, you know, I learned the hard way. So when my panic attack hit me out, my heart was pounding, I was sweating, I couldn't breathe. I was pretty sure I was dying. Uh, maybe a heart attack or something like that. I don't know what it was, but it was profound for sure. Um, you know, and the first thing I did was I, I called a doctor. So I told the doctor what was going on and he said, no, 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 you're not dying. You're having a panic attack. He said, I'm going to write you a script, run down to the, uh, to the local pharmacy and get this filled right away. You're going to, you're going to need this. He said, uh, you know, take it four times a day as it's going to say on the bottle, make a, an appointment with my office and we'll get you in here and we'll talk about all this and figure out what to do. Of course, I'm in the middle of a panic attack. So, yeah, yeah, okay. And off I went and ran down to the, uh, to the drugstore and I picked up my Advan. Now, pause right there for a moment. I probably took a multivitamin maybe some weightlifting supplements or something like that, an aspirin once in a while. I certainly was opposed to the idea of psychotropic meds. Uh, again, I'll admit to some arrogance there. Oh, you need an antidepressant? You know, just get your shit together, bro. That, that's not it. <laughs> that's, that's an old version of me. But, you know, at the time I felt that way, but when I needed it, I needed it. So, you know, down I went. I didn't know what Ativan was. Um, I didn't know what a benzodiazepine was. Uh, I'd never heard of clonopin. Uh, vaguely had maybe heard of Valium, had no idea these things were related. Uh, you know, at the time, there's a lot of Xanax prescriptions out there. So I had heard of Xanax, but I had no idea how it worked. I had no idea that it was a benzodiazepine. Again, I didn't even know the word benzodiazepine or benzo at this time. Uh, just totally clueless on this stuff. So I went down there and I got my half a milligram of Ativan four times a day and dutifully ingested these things. Uh, it's prescribed always. Um, 
and off I went. So, you know, I got my, uh, I got my appointment with the doctor and I you know, told him about my life and he said, okay, yeah, you know, you have an anxiety problem. We're going to keep you on this med. And, you know, I wouldn't say that half a milligram of Ativan had a profound effect on me, but, you know, I felt a little better. And he didn't mention the word benzodiazepine or benzo. He didn't mention tolerance, dependence, paradoxical effects, dangerous withdrawal, interaction with alcohol, nothing. Uh, I've since learned it because he didn't know. Uh, he was just completely uninformed. Um, I don't think he's a bad guy. I, I think he was trying to help me, but you know, just like this thing with Top Gun and dropping bombs, this this doctor was in a system that you know enabled him to practice legally and, and despite his best intentions, ca causing a lot of unintended damage. So, you know, there, there there's an analogy there. But anyway, you know, I took my I took my Ativan four times a day, and you know, I felt pretty good, and you no know, more panic attacks, and I uh, went back about running my business and dealing with the crazy girlfriend, and you know, eventually realized that a lot of my problems were because of the crazy girlfriend. So she had to go. And I, I took care of that. Um, never occurred to me to get off the out of it. And I'm a, it, it's a very strange thing looking back, you know, why, why wasn't I eager to get off of it? I can't explain it. I, I mean, I just think at that point, you know, so much anxiety uh, and some depression, you know, from, from all the stuff that had happened. And I don't know. I just wasn't questioning. Um, and we'll talk about informed consent a little later here. But, you know, I got rid of the crazy girlfriend. I ran my business. And, uh, you know, three, six months later, I was actually doing really, really well. Uh, highly productive. My business was growing as fast as I could stand it. Uh, you know, everything was sunshine. I, I was doing great. Um, but something insidious was happening. You know, I won't spend a lot of time with this group, of course, talking about neuroadaptations that, that occur with long-term benzodiazepine use. But, you know, I, that's certainly what was going on with me. Um, you know, these things happen. And so, you know, it went from the Ativan being less and less effective to, you know, I crossed that line and it flipped into paradoxical effects. Now, I did not know anything about dependence. I did not know anything about paradoxical. I just didn't know any of this stuff. And what I experienced is something called medication spellbinding. And maybe some of you have heard of this. There's a guy, Dr. Peter Bregan, wrote a great book. Uh, one of the first books I read when I was going through acute withdrawal called uh, Medication Madness. It's mostly about uh, SSRIs, but he talks about benzodiazepines in there. But that's the first time I came across the term uh, medication spellbinding. And what that means, and this is very germane to these short acting benzodiazepines, is, you know, I went to a doctor, I had a problem. He gave me a pill. I took the pill. I felt a little better. Okay, there's something wrong with me. This pill fixes it. Well, now the spell has started, right? So it wears it off. And, you know, my watch says it's time for the next dose. So I take my next dose. Hey, I feel a little better. The spell is being cast here, folks. This, this is what happens. And, you know, those neuroadaptations uh, that occur with long-term benzodiazepine use are, are insidious. And if you're not warned about them, it, you just can't see it. Uh, and so what happened to me after, you know, I was probably a year into this stuff um, before I really started to have some paradoxical effects. And I didn't know what they were. You know, my baseline anxiety was slowly coming up well beyond where it was when I first started taking it. And, but each time I took my dose, I felt a little better. So, you know, the spell is cast. It never occurred to me to question it. And fortunately, my prescribing physician was uninformed. So, um, you know, I didn't know these terms at the time, um, you know, but what I experienced was, you know, increased anxiety that, that became extreme, uh, depersonalization, derealization, uh, extreme disinhibition, depression, rage, uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, and unfortunately, is uh, a lot of a lot of folks, particularly it seems military guys with PTSD go through, um, you know, uh, substance abuse became 
a big thing for me. Uh, and while I'm talking about that, I just pulled up in front of me. This is uh, the 2003 uh, Veterans Administration DOD clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of PTSD. And I'll just read a couple lines that I highlighted uh, when I discovered this document way too late. But uh, put my cheaters on here for a minute. Wow. Uh, and this is straight from this document. This is dated June 2017, although I think the original, this language was added, I think, in 2013. We recommend against the use of benzodiazepines for the primary treatment of PTSD and due to lack of effectiveness and risks outweigh the benefits. Now, if I go down a little bit, benzodiazepines are ineffective for PTSD treatment, are associated with worse overall severity worse psychotherapy outcomes, aggression, depression, and substance use, and are relatively contraindicated with patients uh, for patients with PTSD. Well, no shit. I wish my doctor had read that before he put me on the app, but uh, unfortunately he was on un a And you know, I skipped a big part about my struggles with the, uh, with the VA. That's a, that's a whole other topic but i did you know initially go to the va because i was having problems and you know i characterized that experience as an 18 month maze with no cheese at the end you know luckily i'm a you know retired officer and i had you know business that was doing pretty well i was able to go you know out of that system and, and pay for a very expensive private uh you know a psychiatrist unfortunately a lot of guys aren't able to do that and you know this is part of what we'll get to later about veteran suicide. But, you know, that that checklist that's in that uh, treatment guide, there's, uh, you know, I lived that. I, I went through every bit of that. And, you know, the severe disinhibition uh, was a thing. And I think that's, you know, that's why a lot of particularly veterans with PTSD or treated with benzodiazepines ends up, end up with substance abuse problems. You know, for me, it was... Uh, you know, at first it was sleep. I just, just wasn't sleeping. And I was a, you know, I slept like a bear my whole life. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, I'm having trouble sleeping. I'm not in uniform anymore. Uh, hey man, smoke some weed. I, I was at the VA. I was walking out of the VA in the parking lot and the soldier, he's not crazy. Like he's coming out and this is had it. And I started talking to him and he's like, you need some weed. Or just give me a bag of weed. I don't know where to get weed, but he had, <laughs> so he gave me some weed and, uh, you know, it helped me sleep. So, you know, for a long time, I just would use a little bit of cannabis at the end of, end of the night to slow down. You know, I was still working real hard with my business and all that stuff. And, um, you know, it was helpful, but, uh, you know, that's a slippery slope, uh, you know, and I'll skip the long version of, of the substance abuse, but, it, you know, light cannabis use ended up uh, as heavy cannabis use. And, um, you know, I was in you know, I'm a military guy, all my friends are military. I, I had trouble acquiring the stuff at the, at the time. And, you know, I ended up dealing with some fairly unsavory folks uh, in the quest to, you know, supply myself with the only medication that was working as far as I could tell to keep my anxiety down. Um, and, you know, next thing I know, we're off to the races with cocaine. So uh, that was a very short but intense experience for me. Remember, I was completely dis Inhib disinhibited here so you know as soon as it was suggested to me uh that i should try some good cocaine i mean i just couldn't do the math I, I couldn't do the risk reward calculation there i mean i i was so bad at this point uh, i described it to a physician years later as i was watching my life unravel like i was outside looking in through a dirty window um you know these were my my paradoxical effect. and I didn't know the term paradoxical effects at that point. It's just how I was able to describe it. So I had a very short but very intense uh, uh, with uh, you know some very serious, very dangerous uh, substance abuse. And uh, you know, let me go back. We're four and a half years into the Ativan at this point, um, and I'm going back every few months talking to my prescriber, and I'm telling him what's going on in my life. Um, you know, I was having uh, the cognitive fog was very bad. I had a, a highly technical business that, that I built. And, you know, I was the architect of all the technology of it. it was maintaining it and running that and building the business was, you know, it was cognitively difficult enough without 
um, you know, the out of van making me dumb, which it certainly did. And, you know, the effect of that on my business over some years was, you know, at one point I should have been worth, I think about $22 million. Um, you know, at the end I was living on my pension and my partial disability, which I still have. So, I mean, I made a lot of bad decisions. I wasn't able to think things through. I wasn't able to analyze processes and, and all this stuff. And it just absolutely destroyed my business. You know, if we have people here who went through extreme paradoxical effects, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's not unfamiliar to you. I mean, at one point I looked around my house, I had cardboard boxes full of unopened mail. Uh, I couldn't pay my bills. Uh, just opening my mail was too much for me. Um, Stop paying my mortgage destroyed my credit uh my house was in foreclosure at one point i was a day away from a sheriff's sale thank god i had a good buddy i went through uh flight school with kind of bailed me out at the last minute and i had to sell a rental house i owned to, owned to pay him back. but you know i certainly had the ability to pay my bills and financially I wasn't functioning. I mean, I was so disconnected from reality that I didn't care. There were no consequences. I mean, I had a really, really extreme case. And, you know, this is how I know now that, you know, I'm in that 15 to 20% cohort of folks who, uh, you know, we call uh, exquisitely sensitive, right? So that's a, a smaller group of us, but 15 to 20% is not insignificant, uh, certainly for a prescriber. I mean, it needs to be well aware of that. But there I was uh, with extreme paradoxical effects, destroying my life, destroying my financial life, destroying my relationships, my physical health. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and dry, injecting who knows what because I'm getting it off the street and my arms are all torn up. So I went into my regular appointment uh, you know, with my my Ativan prescriber. And I said, doc, look what I'm doing to myself. I, I need help. And he says, you need to go to rehab. I said, yeah, no shit. I need to go to rehab. I'm like, I'm going to die, man. Like I knew it was bad. I was detached from reality, but I, I mean, I could see that, you know, I needed help. So, you know, I go to him and ask for help and he said, okay, well, you know, I didn't know Ativan was a controlled substance of, of any sort. I had no idea. He cold turkeyed me off the Adam. He said, well, we're going to send you to rehab. We've got to get you off the Adam. So, um, you know, I argued with him for a couple of years after this about whether he cold turkeyed me or not. What, what he did was he cut me down to 75% and then two weeks later down to 50%, um, which is essentially a cold turkey when, when you've been on it as long as I have. Um, you know, the timing was particularly bad because at that moment I was busy. I, I was going to rent my house out. Uh, on Airbnb, which which I managed to do. I had to get financially well, and, and that worked for me. But I was in the process of moving into a little apartment down the road. And uh, that was stressful enough on its own. So, you know, now here I am coming off of the Ativan really, really hard. Um, I've got all this additional stress in my life. And, you know, my friends who were helping me move will tell you, I was bouncing off the wall like flubber on a racquetball court. I mean, it was just zing, zing, zing. I couldn't focus on anything for more than a few seconds. Uh, you know, talking to those friends who are great friends and, and have stuck by me through all those years, um, they had no idea what was going on. Just like I had no idea what was going on. But they said, "You man, you were, you were bad. There was something really, really wrong with you. Yeah, no kidding. So, um, you know, I knew I was supposed to get off the Ativan, um, but my stress got so bad and I assumed it was from the move. I didn't realize what I was experiencing was the beginnings of acute withdrawal or, or, or early acute withdrawal. I had some extra Ativan sitting around. So for about a week while I went through that move, I just went back up to my, my four times 0.5 a day just to take the edge off, which is all it did at this point. And then I ran out of Ativan. And, you know, again, I, I couldn't reason. I couldn't make choices. I mean, it was just terrible. So here's what I experienced during the acute withdrawal. And I, I'll say it took about two weeks after I, I took my last dose before I really hit the peak of it. Um, you know, in those two weeks, there was a period where I, you know, I wasn't sleeping at all, maybe an hour, two hours at, at a time, but I had an insane amount of energy. I, it was actually manic. Um, 
I was getting up and running eight miles at four o'clock in the morning for, for no reason. Just that's the only way I could burn the energy off. Um, you know, a lot of other things in my life. I mean, I just had this insane amount of energy and it was, it was almost positive in a weird way for a minute. But the, by the time I got two weeks into it, here's where I found myself. couple times a minute, it felt like someone took a glass of cold ice water and dumped it over my head and it just ran down my face and my whole body. Uh, my entire body was electrified, like I was hanging on to a, like an electric fence or something. Wow. I was hyper salivating so bad that it was actually almost foaming at the mouth. Um, my noise sensitivity got so bad uh, that just the sound of the air conditioning going on was like sticking my head in a, in a jet intake. Um, light sensitivity. Uh, I experienced severe clinical paranoia. Um, my gut was an absolute disaster. Um, you know, I couldn't focus on anything for more than a couple of seconds. I mean, it was really, really bad. Now, at this time, having not been warned about the possibility of, of such an experience, I have no idea this is the Ativan. None whatsoever. No clue. Um, you know, I'd been robbed of my ability to reason and analyze. That's why my business was going downhill. And you know, the same was true for, with my self-analysis. I just, I just couldn't put all this together. So I got on Google and uh, put in my myriad of symptoms and i came up with multiple sclerosis of all things uh, i found out later that that's a common misdiagnosis uh, when someone doesn't realize they're going through benzodiazepine withdrawal interestingly for me though my brother has multiple sclerosis so this is a very believable answer that i got from google so I get my brother on the phone and I tell him what I'm going through. And he says, oh man, yeah, you have MS and it's bad, dude. He says, you need to go, you need to get to a neurologist now or you're, you know, you might die from this. You know, so I called my GP to get a referral and I, you know, it was three weeks or something like that, you know, and I begged and begged and they just weren't hearing me. And I, you know, I probably should have gone to the emergency room at that point. I'm sure I was at the threshold of, of having a seizure. Uh, very lucky it didn't go a little bit further. Um, you know, I'm, I was in very, very good physical condition at that point. I, you know, I think that may have saved me. I don't know. I'm guessing, but my brother called me up the next day and said, Hey man, are you taking any benzodiazepines? What's a benzodiazepine? You know, a benzo. What's a benzo? <laughs> like, what are you talking about, man? I never heard these alphabet soup words before. And he said, oh, yeah, man, I, you know, I have a couple of friends who run Xanax and, you know, they went off of Xanax and they went through this. It sounds like what you're going through. And I said, I wouldn't take Xanax, man. Everybody knows that's bad news. And he goes, well, that's not the only one. And so he starts listing off all the benzodiazepines and he gets to Ativan and bingo. I said, yeah, I've been on it for years. I just went off of it a couple of weeks ago. And he said, man, you're going through benzodiazepine withdrawal. God bless Dr. My Brother, who isn't even a college graduate. You know, he, he's, he just knew. Brilliant guy, by the way, very successful. But, you know, my point is we got to look out for each other. You know, these lessons we learn are valuable. And, I, you know, that's why we're all here talking about this stuff. Um, you know, he said benzodiazepine withdrawal. So I got on the Google again and I looked at benzodiazepine withdrawal. And that was the beginning of a journey that, that that's brought us here, which, you know, yeah, sure enough, I was going through benzo withdrawal, no doubt in my mind at this point. I'm very angry with my doctor. Uh, I call his office up and he's on vacation. Uh, you know, I'm a guy who's used to solving problems with explosives. And I'll tell you that uh, I was going to talk to that damn doctor. And I made sure I applied enough pressure to get him on the phone on whatever tropical island he was suck sucking coconut drinks out of. But uh, you know, he was really mad at me. Uh, he was pissed that I was bothering him on vacation and he wanted to know. And I you know, listed my symptoms again and he said, it's stress. Stress. He said, I was, it was stress. I was overwhelmed by stress. 
there's some truth to that, but that's not what he meant. You know, <laughs> he just couldn't accept that it was that. So, you know, he probably got on the Google for a few minutes. He called me back, you know, maybe an hour or two later and said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to write you a script for Valium. And I said, okay, I need this right freaking now, dude. Cause I'm dying here. I really should have gone to the emergency. I'm dying. I need it right away. I said, don't send it to my usual mail order pharmacy. I need it to go to my local pharmacy. So I guess he probably put his coconut down and called it into the, to the office and forgot to tell him not to send it to my uh, mail order pharmacy. Cause that's where I went. So, um, 10 days later, I, I got uh, some Valium in the mail uh, and he had prescribed me to replace my two milligrams of Ativan I'd been on for, for four and a half years, two milligrams of Valium. Clearly has not read Ashton, right? <laughs> Which I gave to him probably a year later, but uh, you know the equivalence would have been 20 milligrams. And by the way, I was so far into tolerance, I probably needed 30 milligrams of Valium to, to experience any kind of normal. Well, We'll never know. You know, he certainly didn't know at the time. But here's what happened to me in those intervening 10 days is, you know, over those two weeks, I went up that very, very steep uh, curve to acute withdrawal to the foaming mouth and all the things I, I described. But 10 days later, I had come over the peak of that. I was in absolute hell, but I could tell that, you know, my symptoms were getting a little better. Okay, so 10 days later, this other benzodiazepine shows up. I already don't trust this guy. I'll obviously have an extreme dislike for the benzodiazepines at this point. And I look at this and I'm going, I'm not taking that crap. I know I'm getting better. I feel like I'm getting better. And in my linear mind, not realizing that that curve was going to go like that, thinking it was just going to continue down at the slope I'd experienced over the, the previous 10 days, I, I tough it out. I figure three, four months from now, I'm going to be fine. So I'm just going to hunker down and tough it out, which was a dumb move. But eh, I shouldn't say it's a dumb move. It, was, it made a lot of sense based on what I knew. The problem was lack of information here. Uh, you know, if I had any understanding of it, well, I wouldn't ended up in the, that situation in the first place. If my doctor had any understanding about how to de-prescribe this stuff, I wouldn't have ended up in that, in that place I ended up. And uh, I'll tell you, years later here, I, I'm convinced that a lot of the lasting neurological damage I'm still living with happened through that period of, of uh, you know, that cold turkey, uh, that acute withdrawal. So here's what I did. I sat in a darkened apartment, uh, shades drawn 24 hours a day, uh, air conditioning at 65. I had noise canceling headphones on because I couldn't stand the sound of it. I made a nest of giant beanbag chairs and blankets, and I sat there and rocked back and forth for about seven months. Um, during that time, uh, or looking back at that time, I can say I am completely understanding and sympathetic to anyone who chose to give up. Um, it's a very, very sad thing, but it's very understandable easy to understand how you, how you can get there. I certainly, uh, you know, considered taking myself out at that time. Uh, what, what saved me, you know, I'd learned some toughness through, through my service. Um, plus I think I'm just stubborn, which I come by, honestly, uh, love you, dad. Um, but I had two kids, you know, I have two sons and I just couldn't do it to them. You know, just the thought of my kids uh, being left uh, without their dad was was enough to fight to make it to the next, you know, minute for a long time, and then you know, eventually the next hour, and after some time, the next day, and you know, just had to fight through it step by step by step by step. But in that, uh, and I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I did that. And you know, if any of you are at that point right now listening to this, please don't give up. Do not give up because you. Here you go. It's on the t-shirt. Keep moving forward. You can get through it. You know, everyone can, can get through it. Uh, particularly if you understand why you're experiencing what you're experiencing, you, you will heal. It just takes a lot of patience uh, and a lot of faith that you can get there. But, you know, you're not lying to yourself telling you you're going to get better because you will. But 
you know, during this time, uh, you know, I found that book by Peter Bregan was the first one. I was trying to understand, uh, you know, these medications and it made me crazy. Uh, another thing I found at that time was a website called badbenzos.org. Um, I would not be surprised if many of you are familiar with it, but that was my gateway to the benzodiazepine support community. Um, you know, there's a woman, Cass, uh, I can't remember her last name right now, but she wrote a couple of really beautiful, well-composed letters uh, before she committed suicide and talking about what she experienced and, and warnings to physicians and explanations to her friends and stuff. And I read that and knowing that I wasn't alone, uh, knowing that I wasn't the only one going through something like that uh, gave me strength and hope. And, you know, that's why we're all here right now. Hopefully uh, carry that forward. If, if you have someone who needs to understand that they're not alone, go, go look at badbenzos.org. It's, it's a very simple website with incredible content. Uh, and through that, then I found Benzo Buddies and all kinds of other stuff. I found the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. Uh, and that's where I really started getting a lot of my education from. And, it, you know, I like to joke that I put myself through medical school in, in you know, the year that followed my, my cold turkey. But, you know, uh, I've come to understand pretty clearly, uh, you know, how these neuroadaptations occur and why it's so difficult to get out of them. Um. Yeah. So there I was. And then I had to go to rehab. So I went to inpatient rehab uh, while I was going through acute withdrawal. Wow. I will tell you that inpatient rehab is brutal if you are otherwise healthy. Um, it is twice as brutal if you're going through benzodiazepine withdrawal. So you know, some follow on discussions. By the way, I, I got rid of that doctor. I, mean, I told him he's fired. I went and found another guy who's great. I'll talk to you about Dr. Michael Bohan. I was on the board now of the Benzo Information Coalition. Luckily, he lives here in Virginia, and he was my guy that helped me, who helped me uh, de-prescribe. But I went through all that. Uh, absolutely brutal. A great education. Um, uh, but it, it was really, really hard because of the Benzo withdrawal. So uh, somewhere in there, I found the Ashton Manual. Thank God bless that woman. Uh, I understood that you could de-prescribe and there was, you know, she had a formula, at least a place to start. Um, and I don't even know how I found Dr. Bohan, to be honest with you. You know, if you've looked for a physician to help you de-prescribe responsibly and, and well, that's it, a tough search. Um, again, somehow I got lucky. It must've been on Google. I found this guy's name's Dr. Michael Bohan. He was a uh, retired Navy uh, doctor. He had been the uh, chief of medicine at Portsmouth Naval Medical Center and uh, had spent many years helping um, people with addiction and with de-prescribing benzodiazepines. He just happens to live down the road from me. So I got into his office and um, you know I'd already started on Ashton. Actually, no, I hadn't at that point. I needed to get that uh, diazepam. I needed to get that Valium prescription to replace. So I went in there with Dr. Bohan and you know, we figured out, okay, well, you've been in withdrawal for so long. And we kind of guessed what the replacement dose of Valium was. We hunted around with that a little bit. It was, uh, it was around, ended up around nine milligrams uh, to take the edge off enough. So I didn't want to kill myself. Uh, I was certainly far from well, uh, pretty much couch bound at that point, but it helped a lot. Uh, and so we started Ashton from there and I got down to about, uh, let's see, it was four and a half, maybe five milligrams. And the Ashton protocol was, was too fast for me. Um, I've since learned that, that that's not uncommon. You know, we get down there four, four to five milligrams, uh, and it becomes absolutely brutal. So, uh, that is when we started looking into the daily micro tape. Now he'd had, like I said, he'd been doing this for 30 years. He had a lot of experience. Uh, he had some patients who were a couple of years ahead of me on that journey. These are my Benzo buddies, uh, Mike and Earl, if you're out there, thank you. Um, he set me up with those guys and they had used some different methods uh, with their micro taper. Um, uh, Mike really liked the liquid micro taper and he didn't like to 
pretty exuberant guy and he convinced me to try the liquid micro taper. So, uh, you know, I was using milk, uh, whole milk and I was grinding up my, uh, my diazepam and ma making a solution. And, you know, I understood the concentration in the lab work and I, so many milliliters a day. And I made it so that one milliliter a day of reduction was uh, one microgram of, of a Valium. That's all I could tolerate. Um, but the first time the milk went bad and I knocked that back in the morning, I said enough with the, with the liquid micro taper. Uh, so I went dry micro taper. Um, and, you know, I went and got my, got my lab scale and my, my gel capsules and laboratory spatulas and I made a big elaborate spreadsheet that I'd be happy to show you guys if you want to see it. But, um, you know, I just made up my business to see, you know, taper as quickly as I could. And I kept detailed records. Um, I had all kinds of theories about tapering theories of my own. Again, remember I was a research scientist in a prior life. Uh, and I had my logarithmic taper and my linear taper and, you know, holds and not holds and all this stuff. And it's funny, uh, you know, when I go back and I graph the data, because I tried all these techniques, all kinds of theories about, well, you need a fixed percentage of reduction each day. That gives you what you call a logarithmic taper. You know, I did the math on that and made my spreadsheet. Folks, I don't think it matters. I think you just got to keep producing. Uh, you know, there were plenty of times in there where I had to hold. You know, I heard people talking about holds. Uh, I would say that if you hold for more than a few days, you're probably doing damage. I, th I think you got to keep going down. Um, and it hurts. You know, uh, the waves are going to come no matter what you do. You, you can't stop them. The waves are just always going to be there. And, you know, I tried to, to see some causality in, in the rate of taper, you know, rate of taper in the waves. I, I just don't think it's there in retrospect and looking at my own data and my notes. I think the waves just come and I think you just got to keep going would be my advice. But especially in the early stages of a taper, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a psychological crutch. Go, you know what, five days, I'm just going to hold. Um, maybe your wave will pass in those five days. Maybe it won't. But, you know, my personal advice would be to, man, you start going past a week. You need to think about just powering through um, because, you, you know, you reverse the tolerance. You, you start building it up again. But you know, I graphed all my data through these various formulas I was using to, to adjust my taper rate. And when I look back at it, it's pretty much a line. <laughs> Even though there's a lot of math behind it, you, you just got to get on. Stuff. So, you know, from the date of my last dose of Ativan to my last dose of, um, of Valium, well, I think I jumped off it. I mean, I basically went to zero. It was about two and a half years it took me. Um, every bit of it was excruciating. Um, the vast majority of my waking hours were spent laying on the couch. Uh, I couldn't socialize. Uh, my anxiety was so bad. Just going outside was awful. Um, you know, I'm now a single dad. I had two fairly rowdy boys. Um, what, what was taken from me and in, in my relationships with those boys is, is awful. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't wish that on anybody, but you know, we, we fixed all that now, but you know, the cost of not being informed here is it's incalculable. You know, the, the productivity I've lost, the, the relationships with my families and my sons in particular, the, the business I destroyed, the, the financial destruction I've been through, um, you know, and I'm still dealing with a lot of anxiety. As a matter of fact, I talked to Barbara a few hours ago at I'm having a wave today. Um, we're a few days away from three years off for me. Um, and I'm doing pretty, pretty well. I mean, I, I get up at, you know, I, I run four miles at sunrise every day. I mean, walking half a mile three years ago would have been impossible. So, you know, the progress continues, uh, but it's glacially slow. And, you know, watching football with my buddies yesterday, I indulged. I had one Miller life. Just one. I went years without having a drink. Um, and it's been a while and I'm doing great. And I had one Miller Lite yesterday afternoon. I milked that through the whole second half of the game I was watching. And I'll tell you what, I'm having a wave today because of it. So, you know, as I'm talking to you right now, this this part of my face is numb. A little, a little bit of excessive salivation. 
I'm going to spend some time meditating uh, after we get off of here to try to calm that down. Let me go back and talk about a, a couple of techniques that I think might be helpful. And then I'll go forward into the last part of my story here, which uh, I'm going a little long here, sorry, uh, which is the psychedelic medicine and all that. But, uh, you know, I read about mindful meditation while I was in my worst days of my taper. Um, if any of you are into any of that stuff, uh, you know, monkey mind uh, is a thing. It, you know, if you're if you're going through benzo withdrawal, monkey mind is an unstoppable force. I mean, it's, it's just really, really bad. I can tell you that, uh, you know, I felt very frustrated when I would read about these techniques for mindful meditation. I would sit there and just try to calm myself down. And I felt like I was failing all the time. Um, that was incorrect. Uh, the thing with meditation is, is not whether it was a good one or a bad one. It's that you try, it's the practice of meditation, right? So you know, if you're having a, a tough, tough minute, find yourself a quiet spot and, and, you know, get comfortable. And there's plenty of resources out there to help you learn the techniques, but at least try uh, the act of trying, even if you feel like you didn't succeed is, is a healing thing. Uh, and so I'm really, really, really encourage people to try meditation uh, as I got further along in my taper and my withdrawal. Uh, my meditation practices have become better and better and better. And that's a big part of my life now. I spend at least 30 minutes meditating first thing in the morning when I get up. I'm not even, you know, I don't even leave my room uh, before I do that because, you know, I'm sure as you all know, when you wake up that uh, the dawn of consciousness comes with a big shot of uh, glutamate and that panic. I mean, for years, I, I spent two hours laying in bed in, in a total panic before I could get out. You know, you can manage that to some extent. You're going to go through it, but, uh, you know, meditation is a tool I wish I, I took more seriously uh, earlier on. Um, you know, alcohol, of course, uh, you know, I left out a part about that. Alcohol is a way to replace your benzo. So, you know, I didn't know alcohol affected my GABA system. It's way similar to the benzodiazepines. There was a period there where I was still trying to live a normal life when I was going through all these paradoxical effects. I was drinking too much. It was self-medication. It was the only thing that made me feel better, at least temporarily. And then, of course, the rebound from it makes you worse, which is you know true with all this stuff. So, so stay off the alcohol. Uh, I can't touch caffeine. I can't touch sugar. Uh, you know, even at three years now, if I you know, I eat a Reese's peanut butter cup. I'm going to know about it for hours afterwards. And I love those things, but I just can't have them, you know? So uh, diet control is very, very important. I'm sure it's different for everyone. Uh, you know, I can say what's worked for me is I just adopted a very, very bland, uh, low carb carbohydrate diet. Um, Got steady on that till I felt pretty okay. And then I just made a note every time I ate something outside of that diet. Uh, you know, and over the years I've accumulated a log of, of quite a things, quite a few things that are excitatory for me. And you know, my list may be different than yours. Um, you got to be a little bit of your own, own researcher on that stuff. Um yeah. So the last part, and I'll just talk about this briefly because I know we want to have a question and answer here is, you know, as I emerged uh, from my, uh, once I got off the uh, Valium, uh, remember all that stuff about why I had that first dose of, uh, of Ativan? Well, guess what? I wasn't working on that whole time. I was just trying to survive the Ativan, right? So <laughs> probably all of us have that, you know, these unprocessed traumas or, or whatever it is that caused you to get to a point where you needed a benzodiazepine. That's probably still there once you get off them. Um, you know, don't be fearful. You can, you can work through that. You got to get at least the bulk of the, of the benzo problem behind you before that happens. So um, I'm going to talk to you for a moment about psychedelic assisted therapy. In the U S uh, this is considered very cutting edge right now. Uh, it is also mostly illegal, although some of that is changing. I, I have to tell you right up front, 
some of the things I'm going to talk about are Schedule One substances on the Controlled Substances Act, meaning they're very illegal uh, if you try to acquire or even possess uh, these things inside the United States. You are risking incarceration. You know, do not do that. Um, you know, sadly, uh, to access these modalities, a lot of veterans are going out out of the country to. To, to get access to that. And I'm one of those. And I'll tell you at least a short version of that story here in a minute. But um, I say in in the U.S., these are considering, considered cutting edge. What's interesting is I've learned more about this is these psychedelic assisted therapies, uh, particularly through South America and, and large swaths of Africa, have been around for thousands of years. They're not cutting edge at all. It's just the way. Um, I hate to say this, but we're the idiots. Um, so again, I'll tell you my story, how I found that stuff. Um, there's a guy named Marcus Capone. I don't know, he was a Navy SEAL, uh, 13 years on the SEAL teams. I think he did six or seven deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. A lot of combat. Uh, like so many guys who, who lived the life that he lived, he ended up with a fairly severe case of PTSD and was uh, medically retired, sent home. And there he was outside of that structure that I talked about with himself. And he fell into the traps that sadly are all too typical for, for combat veterans. Um, you know, he did go to the VA and, and get on their medication program. I think at one point they had him on a dozen meds. So, you know, they give you one thing for anxiety, one thing for depression. You know, then the side effects pop up and they give you something for the side effects. And they, now you got this polypharmago. I'm not kidding. The guy was on like a dozen psychotropic meds. Uh, I mean, that's insane. Nobody can sort out, you know, what the the effects, of the, you know, the cohort effects that he experienced there. I mean, it's just, you can't analyze that. I mean, it's just such a disaster. And so the poor guy went through all kinds of alternative modalities, just trying to find a way to get better. Um, you know, and he was having some substance abuse problems and his marriage was falling apart and he's got kids and all that stuff. And out of desperation, he heard about this thing called ibogaine. Now, ibogaine is a psychedelic molecule. It's one of the dozen or so alkaloids found in the root bark of the iboga rub that's uh, indigenous to Gabon in West Africa. In Gabon, the Bwiti tribe, this is very much part of their tribal tradition, has been for a thousand years. Um, they use it to seek wisdom from their elders and connect with the rainforest and all that stuff. And there's a lot of you know, shamanism, I guess you, you would call that. Uh, partaking of this bark is a rite of passage for all of their children. Um, there's a lot of really cool stories about that. I could talk about that for many hours. Actually, I have on some of some podcasts, which I can share with you guys later. But uh, Marcus went went down to a clinic in Mexico that was primarily treating heroin addicts. So it turns out that this ibogaine uh, has an eighty percent success rate with a single treatment for treating heroin. It resets opioid receptors, and they come out of there and they're good. But there's nowhere else in medicine you can find something like that. I mean, it's just an incredible thing. Uh, but there was some anecdotal stuff about it being helpful for PTSD and depression as well. So. Marcus, just trying to keep his family together, uh, took a shot and went down to Mexico, did this Ibogaine treatment, came back a different man. Uh, to hear his wife, Amber, talk about it is, is very moving. You know, she says he walked in the door and I could just tell I had my husband born. So, uh, you know, Marcus and Amber went and formed a uh, veteran support organization called VETS, Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions. And, you know, he was familiar with the SEAL teams and he had a lot of buddies who in the same boat he was in. And so he just started running around trying to find ways to get these guys down there to save themselves. Uh, and they, you know, eventually formed that organization. Uh, it's a 501c3. And so they're out looking for donations to try to help these guys get through this program, which is of course not supported by the VA and any, anything inside of the United States. And he comes across, uh, my buddy was Buckley, another fighter pilot, uh, who had his own charitable foundation that, did various things. It was called the Top Gun Fighter Foundation at, at the time. Uh, and somehow they found found uh, Wiz and took him out to dinner and told him their story. And 
you know, Wiz opened up his wallet to help. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm, you know, I'm not a SEAL. I'm a fire pilot, but, you know, here's my mess. And so Wiz went down there, uh, down to Mexico with Marcus, um, Marcus Capone. Uh, also went down there with Marcus Luttrell, uh, notably. I don't know if you guys know that name, but he's the SEAL in the uh, Lone Survivor movie. Uh, great book. You should read the book. The movie is very accurate to the book. The book is better, and Marcus says the book is accurate. So there you go. It's a true story if you want some uh, exciting stuff. But those guys went down there, went through the treatment. Wiz came back and reported this to his uh, – he runs a Top Gun Options group. So he teaches people how to trade options. It's an online thing, and they they do these webinars every week. And he came back and said, man, you wouldn't believe. And I made a little YouTube video on my way home, and – Go check that out. So my buddy in Top Gun Options, another fighter pilot, calls me up and says, hey, Slider, this sounds like you. You need this. And so I went and watched Wiz's video. And sure enough, I was willing to try anything. Now, I was not inclined to hippy dippy fruitcake, long hair, beads and crystals, stuff like that. I was I was a pretty square edge engineer fighter guy. But you know what? With as much suffering as I'd been through with uh, the Benzos, which by the way, are the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. Much worse than any of that other stuff. Um, I was willing to try anything. So, you know, I went down to the clinic, same clinic those guys went to, and it worked. Um, it did nothing for my benzodiazepine symptoms, but what it did was for the first time in many, many, many years, gave me a taste of some real peace. Uh, and I came back with some new perspectives on the meaning of life and, uh, Again, I'll give you guys some links to the podcast where I talk about this. But, uh, you know, I came to the realization that the suffering has a purpose. Uh, nothing is put in front of us that we can't get through. Um, and when you do, you're going to come out stronger. You're going to come out better. Uh, and there's going to be lessons in there for you. And so, you know, this is why I'm here talking to all of you guys today. Um you can get through this. You can get through it. And when you do, you're going to be a better person. And, you know, with great gratitude to my Benzo buddies, uh, Mike and Earl, uh, I've got a bunch of Benzo buddies of my own. And I help. You know, I hope this is helping you as well. Uh, and, you know, if you're not there yet, you will. Uh, and when you are there, you're going to hopefully share my desire to, uh, to pay it forward. That was a lot of talking. Wow, Mark. I, I just, from everyone in our community at Benza Warrior community, I just, I want to thank you for sharing your incredible story with us today. It's it's different. It's a very dynamic. It's intense. And, and it's remarkable what you're doing for people. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. My pleasure. For the, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>